I'm the collection specialist for artist books at the Achenbach Foundation for Graphic Arts, and I curate the exhibitions up, uh, up in the Logan Gallery. Uh, it's good to see you here, and it's um, good to have people able to tune in online today on YouTube, so we welcome all those folks in the digital realm with us today. Uh, I want to acknowledge um, our funder for, for some of the programs we're able to do with the Logan Collection, uh, John Logan, whose uh, Jonathan Logan Family Foundation has supported many of the things that we've been able to do over the past six years here. Uh, today's program uh, is not supported by the Logan Foundation, but by the museum, and I want to thank also Maria Egoaville, of our Education and Public Programs Department for organizing uh, this event today. She's done a great job. I'd like to give her a hand. <laughs> so um, normally the shows upstairs in the Logan Gallery are drawn from the Riva and David Logan collection of illustrated books, uh, which came to the museum as a gift in 1998 uh, it's an amazing collection. It contains most of the iconic masterworks in this art form um, of the 20th century. Um, occasionally, though, we're able to do uh, an exhibition with a contemporary artist. That's the case, and that's why we're here today uh, for the current show. Uh, You know, the Logan Gallery has a, has a very loyal uh, fan base. Uh, and I have to say that the current exhibition of all of the dozen or so shows that I've curated in the last five years, uh, the current show is the most popular uh, we have ever had, in, in my experience, in, in that gallery. And uh, it's a tribute to uh, the engaging work of the artists uh, who will be speaking to you in a few minutes. Enrique Chagoya was born and raised in Mexico City. Uh, he studied political economy at the university there, and at age 26, he moved to the Bay Area. Uh, he earned a BFA in printmaking from the San Francisco Art Institute in 1984 and an MFA at the University of California, Berkeley in 1987. His work has been widely collected and exhibited internationally with a major survey in Spain at the uh, Atrium Museum in 2013. Chigoya has received numerous awards, including a 2021 Guggenheim Fellowship. Uh, he's currently a full professor at Stanford University in the Department of Art and Art History. Enrique lives in San Francisco with his wife, the artist Cara Maria. His work is by turns provocative, hilarious, and confrontational. Among other things, it turns the history of the Western Hemisphere upside down. Please welcome an indispensable artist, an artist we need now, I think, more than ever, Enrique Chagoya. Thank you, Steve, for such a generous introduction. And uh, I want to thank uh, also the Akenbach, uh, uh, the, the Akenbach staff who did an amazing job with the installation of my work. I'm really humbled to the attention that was given to my work. And I'm very happy, happy to be here. Also, thank you to the Legion of Honor Museum, which also had another of my uh, drawings uh, in a previous exhibition, the Color to Line exhibition on pastel from the Renaissance to contemporary times. So I, I, I was uh, really uh, a, a double happy <laughs> being uh, in, in this uh, museum. Oh, of course. So people in the internet could, uh, could follow me and, and anyway. Um, I, I'm going to start a little bit with um, some of the origins of my graphic work and some of the works that had been affected by uh, censorship or attacks uh, or related to censorship issues. 
And I'm going to start with um, images of cartooning. I, uh, when I was in Mexico, I did a lot of cartooning, and that's how I started making um, political social statements when I was studying political economy. I did cartooning for local uh, unions, for the Electrical Workers Union, which was a very progressive, uh, very, very active uh, union for, with a nice newspaper with a lot of essays by the different intellectuals in Mexico. And I used to do the cartooning in their back cover of that uh, union magazine. It was called Solidaridad. And, um, and then I did cartoons of friends of mine, my faculty, uh, my teachers at the university, all kinds of things. The thing is, uh, I grew up in a culture that uh, takes humor as a form of defense against very difficult circumstances, and something that I sometimes miss from, from Mexico, because people make jokes about any tragedy, and it, here is bad taste, but you know, the people make jokes about the earthquake when that happened in Mexico. I'm not gonna tell you jokes about earthquakes here. But, uh, you know, the first time I talked to my sisters, the only thing they were telling me were jokes after jokes after jokes about the earthquake, and we were laughing out loud, and it felt good somehow. When the earthquake happened in San Francisco, I, no way, I, I will not dare to make a joke here. It was, it, it was uh, bad taste. So cultural, cultural situations affect a sense of humor, and whatever is funny in one place is not funny in one, another place. Whatever is... Uh, completely accepted in one place is not accepted in another place. So it's, it's, uh, it's something I have learned uh, from many years of uh, experience of dealing with these kind of things. Anyway, so this is a, a drawing I did for, for a campaign against intervention in Central America that was organized by art critic Lucy Lippard in New York in 1984. That was my last year of my school at the San Francisco Art Institute. And uh, I put it in, in an exhibition, which was part of the campaign. We raised money that we sent to Nicaragua for the literacy campaign. And I didn't think of making art. I thought of making a cartoon. I, well, it's art too, but I didn't think of make, making highbrow art, but lowbrow art. And uh, I decided to make something really large because it was not going to be published in a newspaper. Uh, it was going to be more like a billboard. And I thought I would put this away in the closet. Uh, you know, maybe you know people who like uh, Ronald Reagan wouldn't like to see this in their house, and people who didn't like him um, wouldn't like to see it either. So I never thought uh, this will go anywhere. Um, and, and currently, it's in the, uh, actually this drawing got destroyed pretty much. Somebody attacked the drawing. Uh, they, somebody torn the two sides of the lower. Corner, and I have to make a replica of it. So here is myself making the second copy. Somebody uh, took a picture of me doing that, so I make fun of it. I, you know, like Henry Kissinger painting my butt somehow. In the, um, but, um, but anyway, um, this was destroyed by a Central American person who didn't like it. He didn't like the portrait of Ronald Reagan. And uh, just out of anger, destroyed my work. I mean, I got paid by it, by the insurance, thankfully. But, and the good challenge for me was to be able to do it exactly as close as possible as I could, including the erasing marks, uh, accidents, and all of that. Um, my father used to catch forgers for the central bank, actually, in Mexico City, which is the, the bank that published money. And um, his office was a museum of forgeries. And I, when I was a little kid, he showed me his office. And since then, I wanted to do look-alike things. So you're going to see a lot of look-alike things in this, this show, thanks to that office my father had. Anyway, so I'm going to move on with uh, difficult topics, uh, which uh, fascinate me, like um, the study of Renaissance art uh, that focuses on the sexuality of Christ. This was a book by Leo Steinberg, and um, it's, it's, uh, it's a book that focuses on the humanity of Christ. It, it was, uh, I'm not religious myself, but I am fascinated by the history of religion, uh, in, this, in this case, uh, difficult subject matter. And Leo Steinberg was a very serious historian that dedicated a whole chapter uh, just about this uh, single painting. This one is done by Robert Campin, Madonna and Child in an Interior. 
And I ran into the original painting at the British Museum, and I took this photograph myself. I was just in front of it. And as you might see, the, the focus of, of the, the piece is, um, is I mean, sex, I, I don't need to describe what's happening there. <laughs> so it will be redundant. But um, it, it, it's, it, it's a very interesting book. If you ever find that book, you, you might want to read it. There is no irony. There is no sarcasm in any, any shape or form. It's just a very serious study of, of um, the, the, the symbolic elements behind paintings in the Renaissance like this. And when you go through the whole book, you find a lot of uh, works, uh, like this other one. This one is uh, by Martin van Hemskerk, Man of Sorrows, from 1525, 1530. And during this time, this, this was uh, when I ran into this book uh, in the early 1990s. That's when Jesse Helms began to attack uh, the National Endowment for the Arts. And I decided to make a drawing criticizing the censorship of the National Endowment for the Arts. This one is called Not Good for Funding. Because I, I wonder if today, if any artist today decided to make a painting like this, I, I don't know if that would be uh, allowed uh, without people getting really angry at it or misinterpreting the actual serious meaning behind the work. So by the same token, I, I, I felt very ultra-conservative politicians like Jesse Helms were misreading the art of uh, artists like Robert Mapplethorpe or the, the art of Andres Serrano, uh, which were the two artists that Jesse Helms picked to protest uh, federal money going into the hands of artists. And I felt really uh, affected by it because personally I, I benefit from the National Endowment for the Arts twice and it helped my career. And I, am, I feel very sorry for the future generations of artists who will not have access to the NEA grants that used to be given to individual artists. You didn't need to be nominated. At the time you submitted slides, and if you're lucky, you'll get it. And it will be peer review. So it was like the greatest grant, and I hope someday that might come back and be restored. Anyway, so I did a whole series of this kind of cartooning art. Uh, all of these are the same size as the other one. Uh, maybe the most popular one is, um, this one is called When Paradise Arrive. And this is ab about many things. This is about exclusion. And it could be about colonialism, like this could be just a Native American indigenous uh, character about to be flicked out of the picture. In the middle finger, I don't, it's really hard to, to see it from your seats, but it reads English only. And I, even myself, I ran into some faculty at the San Francisco Art Institute who were upset that friends of mine and myself, some, somebody from Puerto Rico and myself, was, uh, were, were speaking Spanish, we were asked to be speaking in English, when, even though we were talking to each other. And so all these things affected my, my ideas to, to include in pieces, pieces like this. Um, this is at the De Rosa. If you ever go to the De Rosa collection in Napa, you, you might be able to, to see the original. Um, the most recent one you might have seen here, that was uh, the exhibition, Thesis Antithesis. And this is about also many other things. This may be my yin and yang. It could be basically anything. Um, it, it could be anything you decide. To, I, I don't want to give my, my personal interpretation. It's, it goes beyond just oppression versus oppressed. It, it's more, it could be gender issues, it could be social class boundaries. As we all know, humanity is divided in so many things. But at the end, the two sides of the yin and yang are part of the same humanity. To me, this is just a representation of the same element. It's not one against the other. It's just the same. We are all part of the top or part of the bottom, all of ourselves. You know? So that's basically my, 
result of studying philosophy at the university after studying Hegel and then studying Marx, turning Hegel upside down and then criticizing Marx for being overly Darwinist and all these things that uh, I loved to read when I was uh, studying political economy uh, back in Mexico. So this led me to some prints, to a monotype, and I'm sorry I don't have a better slide of this one. This is uh, the one I did right after. Um, uh, in the late 80s at uh, Paula Kirkeby in Palo Alto. She used to print monotypes mostly. And I don't even know where the whereabouts of uh, this uh, print is. So anyway, so I'm gonna go back to what inspired my books, um, back to the conquest of Mexico City. Uh, back uh, in 1519, uh, which ended in 1521. And these are pictures from codices. This is an Aztec codex painted after the conquest. And I have to make sure people know that no pre-Columbian Aztec codices survived the conquest. Uh, there is the possibility of one or two books that might be Aztec, like the Codex Borbonico, but that Codex Borbonico has a lot of uh, handwriting in, in uh, Spanish all over the book, and people don't know if that was a copy done afterwards or if it was per Columbian and then written uh, with Spanish words right after to explain the codex. But anyway, um, this codex is the Codex Tlaxcala, and it's anonymous, and it represents, in this case, indigenous leaders who refused to convert into Christianity. By, uh, they were executed by Fra Franciscan friars, and, uh, and be, besides the, you know, the genocide that took place during the conquest of Mexico City, there was a culture side. Uh, here, you might be able to, to see, let me just point, yeah. Uh, this um, corner, codices. So what is happening here, these are uh, pre-Columbian books uh, being burned. And this is a representation of the accordion folded books that uh, were very much burned because the, the Franciscan priests thought they would be uh, devil worshiping books and they would be uh, obstacles to Christianize the indigenous population. So it was tragic that the biggest library of the continent at the time, the library of Texcoco, uh, was basically destroyed. All the books from that library were piled up in a bonfire, and there was a mass suicide um, immediately after that. Neither the Spanish soldiers or the priests could stop. So that, that was a big tragedy. So zero Aztec uh, pre-Columbian books, except maybe the Codex Borbonico. Um, uh, the same uh, situation happened in Mayalan. A single priest, uh, Fray uh, Diego de Landa, burned pretty much all of the Mayan books that he found in southern Mexico and Guatemala. Uh, Diego de Landa discovered that he made a mistake and eventually he interviewed indigenous people that uh, told the, the many different things, mythological accounts, religious accounts of the creation of the world. And one of those books is the Popol Book that I actually use it as a title for, for one of the books which I'm gonna speak later. But this is from uh, one of the four Mayan codices that survived the conquest. There are only four pre-Columbian, that is. There's other Mayan books painted after the, the conquest as well. But uh, this is from the Codex Madrid, which is currently in the Museum of America in, in Madrid. There is also the Codex uh, Dresden in Germany, that's all Mayan and the Codex Paris in France, which I was not allowed to see when I asked to see it when I was living in Paris for a while because they say a Mexican stole some manuscripts from the Bibliothèque Nationale. And I told them, search me, I didn't do it. They didn't believe me. <laughs> 
and I never got to see the, the Codex Paris, um, even though I was writing an article, f uh, an essay for the uh, LA County Museum for a, for a catalog uh, about the destruction of the pre-Columbian book, so I was not able to see it. Um, but um, the, the other thing is, this is another uh, page of the same Codex Madrid. The, the other uh, fourth book is uh, in Mexico City the Codex Mexico City. Anyways, we use these, some of these uh, pages at Magnolia Editions, and later I'm gonna show, the, the, this one you could see the facsimile in the exhibition, so, but that's what we use for the, the other books. Now, I'm gonna show you another Aztec book painted after the conquest by Fernando de Alba Ixtlizochitl. The, Fernando de Alba Ixtlizochitl, Ixtlizochitl is a, uh, direct descendant from the royalty of the kingdom of Texcoco. And this is uh, his representation of the god of rain. I decided to put it you know, in one of my, my works here with an alien from out of space, which is in this case Superman. If you've read Superman, you know that he came from Krypton, that's another planet. And so he's uh, here nicely dressed as a pilgrim. Although I put a UFO with uh, a representation of uh, the, the god of death and the god of wind in a little UFO in the background. So, but I want to also show another page by the, from the same codex, from the codex Ixtlizochitl, representing the king who built the largest library of the, of the Aztec Empire, the, the library of Texcoco. This is King Nezahualcoyot. Nezahualcoyot translates as hungry coyote. And he was a poet, an architect. Ixtlizochitl uh, claims that he was against human sacrifice. And he uh, was very, very, very much appreciated by, by the people of Texcoco. Now, Ixtlizochitl, I have to say, um, I have to correct myself because in the blog I wrote, I say Ixtlizochitl was a survivor of the conquest. There was an Ixtlizochitl that was his uh, uncle, who also was Alva Ixtlizochitl, <laughs> who survived the conquest. That, that was Hernando de Alva Ixtlizochitl. And he actually became friends with, with the conquistadors because he had, at the time, some conflicts with the other Aztec kingdoms of Tenochtitlan and Tlatelolco. So there are three, <laughs> you want to make it more clear, there are three Ixtlizochitls. There is Ixtlizochitl the Elder, who was the father of this king, King Netzahualcoyot. Then um, Netzahualcoyot had a son who's, <laughs> who's uh, this is like a Garcia Marquez story. Netzahualcoyot had a son whose uh, name was uh, Netzahualpili. And then Netzahualpili had other children, and one of those children were, was uh, Hernando de Alba Ixtlizochitl. And so, the historian I'm talking about, the one who made this book, is Fernando de Alba Ixtlizochitl. And he was a mixed race. I mean, he, he's, uh, he, he's descendant from indigenous people and from Spanish as well. So it's more like a mestizo. But he was speaking Nahuatl. He was very much in tune with the history of the kingdom. Anyway, um, it was rare for an indigenous artist to be let alone to, to make a book. Uh, the, uh, this, this is, I decided to put another one with uh, King Nezahualcoyot uh, in uh, another painting. I have shown this at the Legion of Honor. That was when I had my show there in 1994. Um, so uh, when I learned about the destruction of books in the pre-Columbian libraries, I felt that like more codices needed to be made. So I decided to make uh, a codex that I thought it would be like traveling in time. What if an indigenous painter could travel in time to the present, what that indigenous artist might paint? Following similar ideas of how visual language was used in pre-Columbian books. So, Precolumbian books have a writing system that was non-phonetic, but very precise. 
not too different than the signs that we might read in an airport where you know where the restaurant is, bathrooms, whatever, or the luggage, without words. So it was not too different. The only difference is that today we don't know the reference the symbols are made to. But these were mostly to remind the, the, the people who were reading the books the history, dates, uh, and events that happened. So this one is called, this book, first, that was the very first book I did. It's called The Tales of the Conquest. And it's in the collection of SF MoMA. And gonna keep moving to, and now I'm gonna show you the very first uh, codex I did as a lithograph. This is uh, with Bud Shark in Colorado. And this was in the late 1990s, 97, I believe. And it's called The Return of the Macrobiotic Cannibal. Or, yeah. 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 I read it in Spanish. So that goes with the Border Patrol, with a representation of an Aztec pyramid that doesn't look like an Aztec pyramid, but it was done by Theodore de Brie. And it was just painted after maybe he visited the, 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 the area, but then he told that how did they look to somebody who did the illustration there. In, in my book, there is, uh, it's hard to see, but there's like a couple of businessmen on the bottom about to go to the <laughs> sacrificial altar. But, um, and there's a UFO and things that might read different in different viewers. I made the interaction between Renaissance architecture, indigenous characters, and so on. Uh, and at the end, I end up uh, with Superman and a skeleton I designed after uh, Aztec, uh, Aztec skulls with a, with a skull rack uh, with chincole in the background. Anyway, so I, I'm going to show some other sources of my work that end up in, in, in other books that sometimes get me in trouble, but sometimes I use this as a background for my own self-portraits as a stereotype as you might have seen in the, in the exhibition. And I happened to find this uh, book in the flea market in Mexico City at the Lagunilla flea market. And it was published in Cuba in 1960, actually, um, right after the revolution. And this is where they end up. So, so that's how you, you, you find the same stereotypes, but in this case, I, I show them together with contemporary characters. Some of them are not necessarily stereotypes, but taken from photographs. You might recognize Philip Guston here on the, on the lower right. And Diego Rivera is in the lower left corner. There's some Taliba, Taliban character, African sculptures, etc. And in the walls, you still see images from some of those uh, Aztec books, uh, especially some that were done after the conquest, and many other different pre-Columbian characters. This one is called The Ghost of Borderlandia. And the reason why people have their eyes covered is because they're very close to each other, but they don't see each other. And the wall represents not necessarily a physical wall, but more the invisible walls that very often are put between people, between social classes, between genders, between nationalities, between religions, and whatnot. Now I'm going to go back to censorship again. And just uh, getting into the codices somehow maybe was a curse for me because the codices were destroyed <laughs> and attacked for different reasons. I decided to make a book about the sexual abuse in the Catholic Church, uh, right after I read the, the first articles about it in the, in the Boston Glo or the Globe, back in 2001, I think. And it's, it, it, to me, it was just incredible that in on the one hand, uh, the Catholic Church goes against same-sex marriage or very militant against family or birth control or family planning, and, or, or even preconception pills, etc. And on the other hand, it doesn't do anything to stop, haven't done much or anything to stop the abuse of uh, children in, in, in different institutional uh, situations, and even nuns as well. That, that's a problem that has lasted for centuries. 
In Mexico, there had been nuns that had been found pregnant behind walls of all convents, among other things. So it's a, it's a really old, old problem. I decided to have a little bit of, of um, language of pre-Columbian books, and the way I decided to, to represent something corrupt was by mixing images that could represent a spirituality, but with a soft pornographic comics uh, interposed within each other. There is no representations of Jesus here. There is no, no religious uh, element here. This is more a representation of the corruption of the spirituality. So, so these are uh, pages a little more close up of the same book. And this is the page that Fox News uh, choose to you know, put like a blur on the bottom. I mean, there is no nudity, there is not even contact. And again, it's just to, the way I just represent corruption if I was using the same visual language of pre-Columbian books. Um, so unfortunately, I was never asked to explain my book in Fox News because I would have been explaining what I explained to you. This is, this is not about uh, Christ, this is not about beliefs, this is about the corruption of institutions, like the, in this case, the Catholic Church. So uh, people got very militant against it, and there was an exhibition at the Loveland Museum uh, in Colorado, uh, an exhibition of prints by Bud Shark that unfortunately uh, got targeted by the Tea Party uh, during a, a year of elections in 2010. And somebody saw the Fox News uh, show and decided to drive her truck. This was a truck uh, driver. I don't know if she brought her 18-wheeler all the way to Colorado or just to the, 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 the front of it. Uh, and with a crowbar, destroy the book. Uh, she was tackled by some of the other attendants of the museum and, or, or museum visitors. But uh, the thing is, I guess nobody told her that this was a print. It was not an original. And, you know, if anything, the, the, the rest of the copies of this print got more in demand. Um, I, at the time, I thought, oh, I should invite her to all of my openings so, uh, <laughs> so I could have a little, like, performance art. And, you know, it, it, it's okay to lose one print out of 40. Uh, so, but then it got, it got ugly. It got, I got, like, threats, you know, like, baby. People went totally crazy. And, but during this time, there was a pastor who um, asked me, why did I mean to, to uh, behind my, my codex? Uh, because his congregation, this is a, a pastor from the, from the, it's called the Resurrection Fellowship, which is uh, maybe the largest congregation of uh, evangelist uh, congregation in, in Loveland. And he asked me, if I could explain to him the content of my, my book. And I explained to him exactly what I told you. And then he wrote back to me and said, thank you for your thoughtful explanation. If you ever come to Loveland, it will be an honor to meet you. <laughs> and I was, wow, uh, I, I, I immediately wrote back to him. I, say, I told him this was uh, a Pastor Jonathan Wiggins. I wish uh, most Christians were like you, you know, because... Um, uh, this is not. This is. This is not about. Uh, there is no no Jesus there, and he agreed with me. I don't see a Jesus there. Is not my Jesus. So there is. He totally agreed. Uh, he was against the, the sexual abuse of children and, and, and nuns in the Catholic Church and also in other institutions as well, because it's not the only place. Uh, so we became instant friends. And he became also under attack. People invited to go into his house, to attack his house. Uh, so it got really scary. He had to get at the, uh, some detail to protect him. And myself too, uh, uh, at Stanford, and my neighbors. It, it was just really, really ugly. But eventually people forgot about us. Thankfully, there was another exhibition that was boycotted by the same group in Washington, D.C., at the Smithsonian, Hide and Seek. It was an exhibition of gay artists in history, and uh, that was picked 
because uh, a video by David Von Arovix was showing a crucifix with ants going into the crucifix. And the Smithsonian took down the exhibition within like half an hour. The only good thing was that the rest of uh, the city, all many and galleries and places that could project things into the street began to project that video of David von Aerobics outside. And by then, David von Aerobics was dead, so the dead threats to him did nothing. So, um, so that was a, but they forgot about us, the best part of it, and I was, thank you, David. Um, they forgot about us. And, uh, the pastor, Jonathan, and myself became very good friends. And then he asked me if I could do a painting for his uh, church, uh, a resurrection of uh, Jesus. And I, I told him that, you know, I, I am not religious. I, I didn't know what to do. I, but I told him, you know, if, you know, he risked his life. And, and I say, okay, in appreciation, I, I will do it for free if your congregation accepts it from me. It's, you know, I'm not religious. I thought they were not gonna accept, but they did. <laughs> they accepted it, uh, you know, like with uh, people were like, he showed me a video. So once uh, they, they said, I decided to do it, but I still told him, but nobody knows how Jesus looked like. You know, you, you, you could see it here like a Korean, Russian, Haitian, Native American, Hungarian, Mexican, Filipino, etc. I love, you know, how different they are. They're Chinese, Japanese, uh, West African, African American, you know, and then European American and so on. So uh, I said, mine is not going to be too, too much of uh, originality either, but I'll do it. So this is the painting I did. For, for them, and they loved it. I look into Baroque Mexican paintings, as well as some Dutch paintings, and I make sure I have the, the flag uh, representing love, because if anything, uh, this is about love. And Jesus was more about love. And I have known and worked actually with many Christians doing social work. In Mexico City, I work with a group of um, Jesuits who were doing literacy campaigns, uh, when I moved to Berkeley, I was doing solidarity with Nicaragua through Catholic and, and cross-denominational churches. I admire people like Oscar Romero, who got killed by El Salvadorian uh, army, or Desmond Tutu lately. So I, basically, I don't have any, anything against uh, real Christians. So I was very happy to do something like this. But it got scarier. They invited me to go to, to an opening for the painting after I sent the painting to them. And uh, then I thought, oh my gosh, they're going to get a two first. They're going to, because Colorado, you know, they're like, uh, they, they shoot you for less. And uh, I, I thought they're going to get a two first. You know, they're going to get the pastor and me in one spot. And... Uh, and I ended up going anyway, and I was afraid. I didn't bring my wife, I didn't invite uh, Bud Shark, nobody. I was by myself, the priest. They put bodyguards on me, uh, so that was great. Nobody talked to me about God, nobody talked to me about uh, Jesus, nobody tried to convert me. They just wanted to meet me, and, to, and they want me to meet the, the, all the pastors and their families. It was great. I spoke to the congregation. I thanked them for their openness. It was the most beautiful event outside of the art world where I live, usually, where I move. And it gave me a big lesson about how, what I was just telling you in the beginning, how context makes the art. Because that same book uh, that created such a controversy in Colorado was invisible in San Francisco. Here it was like just another little... A book or, or, or work. No, nobody complained. That I, it showed many years. I did the book in 2002, and the controversy took place until 2010. But it was a different context. Anyways, I'm going to move on to another book that was censored in Mexico during the Holy Inquisition control of censorship of the books during colonial times. This is a book from the late 1700s, and uh, it's uh, done by Fray Joaquin Bolaños with 18 engravings by Francisco Aguera Bustamante. It's from 1789. And uh, this is just uh, a kind of like a humorous book, 
representing death as something alive. And this is more influenced by Mexican concept of the death than the Spanish or European concept of the death. In the pre-Columbian tradition, life is a dream, and when you die, you wake up and you always end up in a happy place. So there is always a ceremony. So it's like Day of the Dead, but every day, any time of the year. So uh, the idea that there was this fictional character was not approved by the Holy Inquisition, not, not only because it was not exactly the, the European version of death, but also because all fiction was forbidden in colonial Mexico because this is from 1531. The, there was a, a decree to forbid any fictional work printed and, and distributed in Mexico because they say, these are the, the rational, because they say the indigenous people will not understand the difference between reality and fiction. Uh, you know, as is, as is the religious books were. <laughs> Reality. <laughs> anyway, so I love this book. Uh, it's very little. You could see how tiny. These are beautiful etchings. I have I have shown my my own versions of it next to the original engravings in Oaxaca. They let me. They they have a collection at the Instituto de Artes Gráficas de Oaxaca that was run by the artist Francisco Toledo, the late artist Francisco Toledo, and they have original the the book and single prints of, of the, I think it's about uh, 12 or 14 etchings. So you could find facsimiles uh, of that. I have a facsimile that, that no, it doesn't make justice to the, to the etching, but you could see how rich the, the engraving is. But it still, it, it, it works as a reference. Uh, these are other pages from, from inside. Well, the thing is, this book got destroyed by the whole Inquisition. The whole edition, there are very, very few copies that remain. Very few in Mexico. I believe there is one at the, the, the New York Library. And uh, so I have done two versions, uh, my own versions of the Portento's Life of Death. That was the title. So I did this one, is Escape from Fantasylandia, an Illegal Alien Survival Guide. And it's a, you know, the top is kind of like the economy. And I, I just did like a feather snake for the economy here. And the bottom is the portentous life of death with the Mayan characters and all these uh, Mexican cartooning characters uh, happening all around. Eventually, I did also a monotype just with the bottom part of the book, uh, which was uh, through Paula Kirkeby in Palo Alto. She's the one who published the, the monotype I've shown you of my uh, thesis antithesis uh, drawing the, with the shoe. So in the same place we did this book. There was a school in Israel that wanted uh, some print for a traveling exhibition through elementary schools. And we decided to use a little booklet that children use for their school. And I started with uh, characters uh, from uh, Mexican Day of the Dead uh, cartooning on the front cover. And then I did a monotype with um, engravings from the Portento's Life of Death, photocopied with a collage I did of uh, the, this one is probably the Codex Dresden from Germany, which is a Mayan book. Uh, interacting with each other, and then the photocopy was printed with color. We roll up the photocopy uh, after we put gum arabic on top, and then sponge out the gum arabic, and the, the toner of the photocopy absorbs oil, and you could roll over an oily color, and that's how every page was done. It's one of a kind. So this was, unfortunately, I don't have many of these. I only have one of those. I still have maybe one or two copies of the other book, but these were pages. It, it, get, it got a little more clear, I think, than the other. I mix it with uh, Little Lulu in Spanish, which I grew up with uh, reading, actually, and I still have some vintage comics of Little Lulu and what she's saying, what is happening? Is it something important happening right now? <laughs> and, but again, it's the same symbolic interaction between different characters. 
Uh, there is no linear narrative here. So I'm not trying to follow even the, the writing in the book, but uh, it's more different moments of the life of death uh, through Mayalandia, that's how I call it. I got back drawings from children from, from the school, which I, I, was, I was hoping we could have had put some of those in the exhibition here that were really beautiful, but um, maybe some other time. But anyway, and I'm going to end up with the last uh, uh, collaborations we did last year uh, with uh, Don Farnsworth at Magnolia Edition. And we did three books. Uh, it was really fun to do. Uh, we used the Codex Madrid, which is in the background. Hand Trim uh, by Max, uh, who did an amazing job trimming all of the edges by hand. But uh, this book had a lot of uh, back and forth layers in the computer. Uh, the printing is very three-dimensional, very tactile. And it, it just uh, came out. And, and the title of this, by the way, I forgot. Um, you could see it. It's the Popol book. De la Abuelita de la Guisote. Popol Book is one of the Mayan books written after the conquest, and it's, it, it translates as the community book, the community book of the King Aguisote's granny. That's the translation of it. So uh, this one has a combination of two codices. The background is from the Codex Borgia, and that's in the Vatican. And the other one is one of the possible Aztec books that the, what I was just telling you with the snake. Um, Don and I work on elongating this snake from the, the, the Codex uh, Borbonico. And we, we just have an interaction with a Spanish procession on the bottom of uh, penitentes that is usually takes place in Sevilla. So this, are, this is called Tales uh, of the uh, Tales after the conquest uh, or of the post conquest. So you can see a little Mickey Mouse uh, having a, a little hard time trying to. Here is the little Mickey Mouse trying to get out. Oh. I went too far. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, here it is. This is the little Mickey Mouse. Uh, th this is the procession from the penitentes. These are not KKK characters. These are uh, penitentes. And there's more penitentes in the back. We make all these little googly eyes, which I, I love to, to put. I, we decided to put some Mayan characters in the middle of the procession. Um, I usually tend to make fun of our talk. And this one is this, as one in infers historicity, nouns, futurity, and dream temporality. An evocative psychological context is created that underlines or limits on what we choose to imagine. And I, I got this uh, altered from a book that uh, had to be smart in art. Uh, it's like 101 uh, small quotes that are totally free to appropriate. I, I did another little art statement here. Recalls ominous moment of urban experience while subverting the relationship between fantasy and reality. That maybe addresses the idea of censorship in the colonial times, you know, where they, they, they thought that indigenous people wouldn't recognize the difference between fantasy and fiction. Anyway, um, I'm going to wrap it up with the last piece that, by the way, there's going to be uh, an actual print of this one available to see maybe at the end of the presentation. This one is called The, the um, Waters of Oblivion. And it has gold leaf on top of it. And it represents all these, um, if, if, excuse me, all this procession that is very much uh, based by the triumph of Maximilian, you know, all of these uh, uh, characters, uh, the carriages, etc. that was done, 139 panels, which was, was done by Hans Burkmer and also Albert Aldorf, 
Aldorfer. Sorry, I have a hard time pronouncing their names. And uh, we decided just to put pre-Columbian heads on all of the, the characters, indigenous people, etc. And this basically represents mostly that the Spaniards were looking for the treasure of gold, disregarding that the real treasure were books. And in the background, you can see all of these uh, almost translucent. That's from another codex. That's from the codex Kingsborough in, in England. Anyways, with that, I finish my, my talk. I think we might be running uh, a little over my, my time. But thank you very much for listening to it. And I just want to also, uh, if, I guess, announce that the next person to speak here, you're, you're going to announce is a uh, dear friend. Don Farnsworth. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, well, we're going to proceed with um, our next speaker. Ooh, stop touching that. Uh, Don Farnsworth, uh, the proprietor with his wife, Ira, of Magnolia Editions, um, is our next speaker. And if you've never been there, uh, you must know that uh, Magnolia is a studio like no other studio anywhere that I know of. Uh, it produces work in a truly amazing range of media, including handmade paper, woven textiles, ceramic tile, uh, cutting edge, and I have to be careful how I say this, um, uh, acrylic prints printed digitally somehow. Uh, I'm still not sure how that works, but it's very impressive. Uh, and more, uh, endlessly inventive. Uh, Don uh, has pioneered a number of innovative techniques in all of these media. In his work with Enrique Chagoya, his imaginative virtuosity with digital media combined with the vast capabilities of his studio uh, has often made him a collaborating artist in Enrique's work. And I'm so happy that we can have uh, Don here with us today. He's going to speak. Then the two will uh, take uh, questions, if you have any, from the audience. And there will be a demonstration of a mate paper. Uh, that they use for Enrique's books, how it is made, up here at the end of our program today. So, um, without further ado, please welcome Don Farnsworth. Okay, well, thank you. It's always shocking to find yourself behind the podium. Uh, I think I end this show here, and then I start this one here. Um, thank you for coming, and um, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Achenbach, the Legion, and, um, and I'd like to thank the people that made this sort of thing possible, like Enrique's project is made possible by uh, the 40 years of uh, gathering equipment in one location of about 8,000 square feet, and also made possible by the master printers and uh, Nicholas Price and Tulula Terrell and Master of the Universe, Ira Farnsworth, <coughs> my wife, um, anti-war protester, collaborator in art, and everything. Um, so thank you. And then Max Phil is here, and he did the edging, as Enrique uh, told you, on the uh, codices. And, um, and also today, we're honored to have um, Megan Bishop, who is our mycelium expert for breaking down linen paper for the making of Renaissance style paper, which uh, is unbelievable. Yeah, we'll get into it. So that's Enrique and um, Tallulah and Ira at the 10 foot by 8 foot press um, where uh, we can print many, many layers. We can print gigantic panels that are like 6 feet by 10 feet in this case, uh, Deborah or Apollo. Uh, we have also, I'm going to give you an overview of the studio here. This is uh, the etching area where we do traditional and semi-traditional um, copper plate printing. 
and we have a tapestry finishing area. We invented a way of uh, talking to jacquard looms to make tapestries, and there's uh, Arlene Setchett there working with Alyssa Minadale, Min uh, uh, our master uh, tapestry seamstress. We have a lot of masters at Magnolia. Um, and we've done tapestries with Enrique. Uh, we do a lot of work in so many areas. One is uh, we have a, a laser cutter where we can, uh, it comes in handy for so many things. In this one case, it's Guy Deal and I wrote a book on how to build Pablo Picasso's uh, paperboard guitar of 1912. And uh, the book is here if you want to see it. And it's, um, those are some of the guitars in the background. You see a, a Hung Lu, uh, a CNC. We have a CNC machine across the street at a wood shop and a woodcut by Mel Ramos and Chuck Close piece there and a Bruce Connor on the wall. Um, and we do ceramics, as uh, Steve uh, said. There's Tallulah and uh, Claire Rojas is pointing out uh, on the scaffolding where, uh, where to place a tile for the, someday you might see this in the Chinatown suddenly. They're only three years behind schedule. Uh, we finished this project two years ago, and, the, and, and I think we're just getting the tiles out of storage now. Uh, they're fantastic. It's gonna be an unbelievable insta installation. Um, we, importantly, very importantly, our master printer also roasts coffee, and so we have a coffee roasting station. Uh, we roast every week. Uh, it's a Mayan coffee, well, it's actually it's Chiapas coffee, uh, beans that we roast, uh, fantastic. Um, we make handmade paper. This is like the love of my life, is, is now for the last seven years is trying to recreate Renaissance-style paper which is different than the paper you can buy in the art stores because of the texture of the old uh, coarse felts they used in the 16th, 17th century. Um, and uh, Hung Lu, before she died, uh, I'm honored to show you this piece of hers. You can see the texture of the paper is the hairs of the felts that have embossed themselves on the paper. Also opening on March 5th is Paul Costa's show at Anglin Trimble, and here's a snowshoe footprints on snow, except that's paper pulp, and that will be in the show if you get to that opening or show. Uh, today we have, we're honored to have uh, Matt Gonzalez here, and he donated to Magnolia these um, Mayan beating stones for making tapa. Guy Deal, also here today, and also a very huge part of Magnolia. He comes in every week, and we work together on any harebrained idea we have. Uh, is uh, built the handles so we could use these as actually beaters, even though they're hundreds of years old, I suppose. And there they are, and they're all up front here too, so you can see them in person after the Q&A. Uh, apparently, I don't want you, they don't want you to run up all at once uh, for some COVID reason. Uh, and uh, you, to, to make the tapa cloth, you, you take a, a, fig, a fig or a, a paper mulberry, which is related to the fig. You steam the, the uh, wood that you can harvest every year from the tree. You peel the bark back, and we have some you can, we can peel here, and strip the black bark, and then you pound it. Uh, very carefully with these pounding sticks. And that's, that's Mia Farnsworth hard at work there. And that's the sheet she made. Oh, no, we got that one from Mexico. Uh, and um, the, the thing about getting Enrique to come to Magnolia is, is very interesting. Uh, you know, their studio, in, his studio in Stanford is just beautiful. And uh, to give you a feeling of what it's like to get him to leave the solace of his temple, of his, of his meditation, and to come to Magnolia, we have various uh, techniques. Uh, many are <laughs> in his mind, um, and uh, but eventually he will cross the bridge, and uh, we get him to uh, to make it to uh, Oakland. I think for three, four, five months he was coming almost two, one or two days a week, um, and there he's no longer by himself. He's with a group, and here's hung, the late Hung Lu. <laughs> uh, 
Sorry, I'm a little choked up. We got him really there by uh, doing a facsimile of his first codex where the institution that had the codex didn't want to loan it to the Mexican Museum, so we, uh, I think we did a very good job. The original is up there, and this is the uh, facsimile we made. Fabulous job. But we didn't pull all the stops out. Technology is only good in the arts if it can improve something. To, to just say I'm doing a new technology here in the arts, it doesn't really matter if it's, in fact, Technology is very, you know, it's subject to who, who's using it. And, and uh, the, the technology of a paintbrush is fantastic, but you have to have the right bristles. You have to have the right pigment, the right pigment grinder, the right medium, the right, the right everything. So everything is dependent on other things. And technology is only a state of our mind. It's all in our mind anyway. Everything is technology. Here are the three pieces we did after the um, codex there. Uh, pretty amazing in that they have 19 layers of ink underneath because uh, uh, it's acrylic. It's a UV cured acrylic printer that can print in incredible detail and give you a texture to the ink. So uh, we print these 19 layers of clear ink and when we printed the first six layers then Tallulah hand applied um, the, the gold leaf to uh, the areas that wanted gold leaf and then uh, we print on top, and the only way you're going to see the texture is by coming up here afterwards. We have this print right here. So, this is here. And uh, it's stunning to see in person. I'm just, it's like s sparks fly when you're working with Enrique on this. I, ideas, he dreams something. He comes in, talks about his dreams, or that he couldn't sleep at night, and, and, we, and, we, and we change the heads around, and we colorize the entire procession, the, the triumphal procession of Maximilian, we colorized the whole thing. Uh, and then we changed the colors, and we changed them again, and then we changed the heads, and then we changed, and then, and then we changed the gold, and then we added something from the post-conquest. Uh, uh, and then we rearranged this, and we, it's like sparks fly, you have a great idea, and then you undo that idea and start again. So it was just this building and building of, uh, of layers of information, hundreds of layers. And then there's Max working on the edging. Yeah. And then there's the, the, the fabulous John DeMeritt, who did the, the book box uh, for the procession uh, piece. And um, here he is stamping the gold foil onto the first box for Popo Vu. And, and here's the second box. And Enrique directing traffic uh, of where he would like it. Uh, era. Ira has in her hand a die that was used in that hot press that, Henry, uh, that uh, John DeMeritt was using. And uh, I brought it here today, so if you get a chance to come up, you can have a look. It's, and there's Max, and there's, then there's John DeMeritt again. And this is the piece, the wrapper for procession piece. And the first box. And that's it. I was made that nice and fast. I hope you got a feeling for what it's like. To, you didn't, but I hope you did. For what it's like working with Enrique. So, um, I was supposed to say something. Oh, so we're going to, what, what am I supposed we're to say? Maria, what am I supposed Maria's to say? Oh, question and answer. That's it, right. You can't see anything from this podium. Help us with a microphone. So oh, now I see. There are people here. There she is. It's all family. <laughs>